Hey guys, what's up? So today I'm going to share a keynote that I did last year for Intermittent 2017, which was a creative tech conference that was held in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So it was a really awesome event, a lot of great speakers. It was the first time that I kind of did like a bigger keynote about my career. And it was really awesome. It was challenging, met a lot of awesome people. Um, it was recorded, but there were some issues with some of the music that I used. So um, it wasn't published. So I was just gonna kind of redo it for some of the folks who didn't see it. And hopefully this would this will inspire you. So let's get right to it. Um, basically my keynote, and it has a very interesting name, it was called From Rappers to Hackers, right? So if you're watching this, there's a good chance that you are in the music industry or we work together in the music industry or we did some sort of video that involves music um, or you're a rapper. Uh, on the other side, if you might be in the tech industry, um, you might be a security professional, or, or you might be a hacker. And uh, if you know me, you, you probably fit in one of those groups, right? So hopefully, if you do, you won't be offended, but I won't give any guarantees that you won't, so let's just roll with it. Um, why I left the music industry for technology? So this is, uh, this is gonna kind of go over um, sort of my life, you know, from the past to present. And hopefully it, uh, you know, if you were wondering about certain things <laughs> that I did or some of the moves that I made, um, this will probably explain it a little bit better. Um, but let's start from the beginning, right? To, I'm going to share a story about a kid from Queens, New York, who left the cutthroat world of hip hop for the cutthroat world of technology and how dramatically shaking things up can ultimately lead, lead to a better quality of life. Wow, okay, let's check it out. So, QUE, another ENS, that is a lyric from a very sort of, not popular, but an obscure Mob Deep song, but I'll let you guys Google that if you wanna check it out. Um, but my name is Rick Cordero, and I'm a video director, or known as a video director, originally from Queens, New York, and I'm currently living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay, um, so in New York, I was kind of a rebel with a small crew. So in New York, I met a ton of artists, and I began experimenting with video techniques, which essentially became my film school. Uh, like many people who never went to film school, I made a bunch of mistakes along the way, um, but it was the best way I knew how to learn and express myself. So I didn't actually get into video directing until 2006, and it was completely, completely by accident. Um, blue magic, okay. So this is a funny story. So I have a friend, um, Steve Carlos, who at the time, and still does currently, worked at Def Jam Records. Right, and um, one day he asked me if I'd like to make a video trailer for um, for Jay Z. Uh, it was a video trailer that was going to be titled "Blue Magic," and it was for Jay Z's new album that he had coming out called "American Gangster." So I thought it over <laughs> for like a second, right, and I said, "Yeah, of course I'll shoot a trailer for Jay Z." Um, so, uh, long story short, I shot the video with. Uh, with Nancy Mitchell, my creative partner, um, and some friends in about an hour all around New York City. So we filmed, we ran, ran around New York, we, we kind of pulled, it was really run and gun, like super guerrilla style. And uh, I think it was kind of to capitalize off the hype of the album, you know, it was a real sort of grassroots thing. That was uh, that really was never done before. It wasn't like this really calculated commercial label involved thing. Even though the label was involved, it wasn't like you know it wasn't like a commercial, right? It wasn't an ad. So um, so we we shot the video, and um, I remember the first time that I met Jay at Quad Studios, and he was putting the finishing touches on the album, right? Um, and uh, I remember um, he was listening or he was watching American Gangster, which at the time it wasn't out 
Um, it was still like, it, it hadn't premiered in theaters yet. So he was watching a bootleg version that I found out later on he received from Denzel Washington. So it was really interesting that um, Denzel had this, like had a copy of the film before it even came out. <laughs> um, I'm sure he was the only one who was allowed to have a copy. I don't know, but, um, but he gave it to Jay. Um, to, to get inspiration, right, for, for making the album, which I thought was cool. I mean, he was watching the movie and really trying to get a feel of the characters and stuff, and it inspired him to, to make the album. So that, that, to me, was like, wow, that's, that's like, super awesome. And, like, that's, you know, I'm obviously a movie fan, but seeing one of my idols, like, be inspired by movies as well was just, like, another layer of, like, where am I? I can't believe this is happening. Um, so, you know, his, uh, so the reason that I went there was that, you know, uh, the label wanted, wanted him to watch this trailer that we had just shot, like literally 24 hours ago, uh, before meeting, before he met me. So, um, so I was just like in the lobby, right? <laughs> if he didn't like it, then he didn't actually have to meet me or say yes, or, you know, save any embarrassment, right? Um, so after about what felt like an hour, it was probably less than that, but it felt like an hour of waiting in the reception area, uh, they said Jay wanted to meet and they brought me into the studio. And I was obviously super nervous, right? It was, it was like I was about to meet the Pope or I was about to meet Oprah or something. It was that sort of like, oh my God, this is like, what? <laughs> you know, and I, I don't normally get starstruck, but it's, you know, it's Jay-Z, right? And the first thing he said to me was I see you're getting your name out there like I I at the time I was I was running around New York and and really just not even like trying to make a name for myself I was just trying to stay busy I was trying to stay inspired and most of all I was really about the culture and I you know hip-hop culture to me was really important it was something that I grew up on it was something that I cared about and whenever I filmed the video, I wanted that to come out. You know, I didn't have the budgets to like have all the shiny things and have like, you know, huge, you know, like explosions and dancers and like crazy lights and, and anything like that. So all I had was like my heart, right? Like I really wanted to show and profess my love of hip hop through the medium of video. And so that's the only thing that I had you know, I mean, outside of like all of my close collaborators, just for me personally, I didn't have formal training or anything. So that was a thing that I wanted to come true. I want that. I wanted to come through in the video before we showed Jay. So, um, so I made the trailer, right? And like I said, we shot it all around New York City. I think we were uptown, probably like in the Bronx or maybe Washington Heights. And seemingly overnight, it went viral, right? It just, it was like the, the blogs and the press outlets at the time uh, proclaimed proclaim that the trailer's gritty style evoked Jay's earliest videos, like Where I'm From or 99 Problems, right? Mark Roman X, 99 Problems, like that's a classic, right? And, and it sent the message that any kid with a camera can go out there and work with major recording artists. And that was, uh, that was a big thing. Like, you know, I, I was, you know, I was like just a young guy, like just trying to like tell a story, right. Or just trying to, um, trying to, trying to make these videos for the right reasons. And I, I don't know. I felt like, uh, I don't know. It felt like, and I, before that, I was I was kind of doing this that you know the same thing, but with like independent artists. But it really felt like um, I was validated, right? Like, like people were responding to to it in a real way, and not just like, oh, it's just low budget, right? Um, so the result, right? So the result of Blue Magic was that there were millions of online impressions and views, which ultimately helped the album reach numerous top 10 lists by the end of 2007. And although the intention for the trailer was a straight to YouTube campaign, the internet response was so overwhelming that major networks eventually picked up the trailer to air as broadcast content. 
which was super dope. And like I said, they were calling it, you know, gritty and, and you know, and street and like all that stuff. And I thought to myself, like, I guess all that bad lighting and all the grainy footage because we didn't have enough lights to like light these hallways and things. And we had like, you know, old Nikon lenses from the 70s that really, you know, were just really blurry and, <laughs> you know, just real bootleg, right? And now it was like trendy, right? And and so that that was like eye-opening for me that there was, you know, we, we went from like the, the late 90s, early 2000, uh, you know, bling and like materialism and started coming back to like this like gritty, just a rap around the corner and um, on the street, just like performing to the camera. And suddenly that was, that was in. And so that was um, the beginning, right? That became the beginning of my addiction to music videos. And this is what that looked like. Um, my next guest, uh, Rick Cordero, if you've watched a hip hop video in about the past three years, you're looking at about 50-50 odds that it was directed by Rick Cordero. He's completely revolutionized uh, the hip hop video making industry. He's worked with, uh, among others, uh, Jay-Z, Busta Rhymes, Nas, The Roots, and I, I swear to you, like, he's made like 75 videos in the last three years. is like lowering the standards of the entire hip-hop industry but uh, you know like if I left it would still it wouldn't you know the budgets wouldn't suddenly rise you know what I mean so it's really just adapting to um, the technology it's really just adapting to um, the technology so <laughs> so by any means necessary so for those that were around you know, in the music industry in 2007, whether you were a blogger or you were, you know, a manager or you were an artist, you know, you were, it was really popping at the time in New York. And there were, it really felt like the, the Wild West. There were no rules. It was about, and for me personally, it was about building my reel by any means necessary, regardless of cost. It was about, you know, unfortunately, it was about undercutting as many boutique video production companies as possible. And that's that's something that, you know, I think is just like business in general um, and it's cyclical. But for me, it was just like, I, you know, I don't I don't have a family or, you know, I don't have like kids or anything. And it was just like, let me just spend all my time filming and screw it like if if i'm undercutting people like that just means that they don't love it as much right it was a, it was kind of a weird attitude that i had um but that's what happened and eventually that led to um a few music video nominations you know i was um i was nominated for a bt award for a best director award i was nominated for um an mtv japan uh, video award and some commercial stuff as well and I got to work with some of my favorite artists you know like uh, The Roots um, stood out to me Joey Badass Action Bronson um, Nas you know Wu-Tang I mean you name it right like I, I worked with Slaughterhouse like 
Royce the five nine. I work with so many amazing. I can't I can't even list them all. But um, Snoop, like it was crazy. And I even got to work with some of my favorite brands like Nike and Levi's and Heineken. It was super dope. Uh, additionally, I got some press write ups in Wired and Rolling Stone, and eventually. And this is an interesting one. Uh, eventually, I even got to sell some sugar water, and that's what, and here's what that looked like. Guys, I got an idea. We open on a cheerleader. So falling short. Now, before I go into that, um, the, the Sprite commercial was interesting because it was part of a campaign that maybe some of you have seen uh, where um, Drake, he's, he's like in the studio and he's like not really feeling the music and then he drinks some Sprite and his body turns into like a robot and like his, you know, it turns like almost like animatronic and then you see all this Sprite coursing through his body and like all his inspirations and things that motivate him. And then it all snaps back. He's like, all right, you know, let's do it or something. I forgot what the line was, but it was part of that campaign. So Drake's commercial came out first and then mine came out second. And it was a really kind of strange thing to like, you know, you have this like, uh, at the time, Drake was like the, the big, you know, the big thing coming out uh, in hip hop. And, and then me sort of like this really obscure, you know, indie hip hop uh, music video director. Um, so it was cool. I got I got a kick out of it. Um, it was really fun. I actually met Drake uh, a little bit later through uh, my mentor, Chris Robinson um, from Robot Films. And he we. I got introduced to him real quick, but I was like, yeah, you know, we were in the same Sprite commercial. And he was like, yeah, yeah, okay. And I, I totally don't think he remembered that, but um, I just thought it was funny. Anyway, um, falling short. So now uh, something about the Sprite commercial, which was an interesting fact, was that I was chosen to be in that spot uh, because Sprite was looking for someone who wasn't white or black. Uh, actually, you know, I over, overheard that they wanted an ambiguous ethnicity, if you will, to lead the campaign. Um, so I think Sprite is actually really big in Asia, but I don't think they necessarily wanted someone who was like super Asian. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's what happened, right? Um, so I don't know. It felt like kind of like, uh, you know, when I was dealing with all that, I felt like I was maybe code switching a little bit, right? Like I was hip hop when I wanted to be hip hop and then maybe, you know, a little more corporate when I wanted to be corporate. And I was kind of getting pulled in both directions. Um, but eventually, right, all that, um, all that goodwill and the reputation that I built as this renegade filmmaker um, started to dissipate actually once that commercial aired it was really strange and you know it felt like a lot of the bloggers and a lot of a lot of the allies that i had who were rooting for me because i was like this this underground kid you know like just trying to make it suddenly it, it became too big of a look or something and and so I, I felt like maybe i imagined it but i felt like a little bit of a cold shoulder after that happened um and here's here's something that I was never told, um, you know, I was exceedingly unlikely to ever see any real money from music videos because most of the income I generated during this time was from ancillary opportunities like the Sprite commercial. And on the rare occasion that I did get a decent budget, I had to make damn sure that all of it was reflected on the production value and spent on screen. Um, another thing that happened around this time is that the DSLR revolution happened. So the Canon 5D uh, Mark II came out and suddenly the, the playing field got really crowded 
and you know it was like the the doors just flung open i mean we had the uh the dvx right uh, and then the hvx which was sort of my bread and butter and now the dslrs came out and it was like all right like well you know everyone can do this anyone could do this right and it's true um and then eventually i got i kind of got jaded right i got jaded working with a lot of temperamental rappers and record labels and being asked to work for you know for very little money or sometimes free just like for favors and this is when chloe was born and the pressure began to mount so i lashed out you know i turned down music videos for like ludicrous and diddy and i would my my irritability was really high so i was kind of like snapping at at people at friends and and people like in in my crew and i think i was just getting burned out from being the low budget guy the gift i had of ushering in this new era of renegade filmmaking it suddenly felt like it became a curse and so my kind of dwindling creative passion for music video directing led to a decrease in work and people stopped calling and you know that led to uh, my savings starting to dwindle as well and with this new family to take care of i knew i had to make um, some serious moves it was it was the only way um, that i could move forward right and get out of this rut so obviously something had to happen Um, now, another kind of major life thing happened to me, and uh, it was around this time that my my dad got really sick, and some of you uh, who are watching this might remember that. And what happened was he got a double pneumonia and a severe strain of the flu. And this was a really difficult time for our family uh, because he was in critical critical condition for over two months and completely sedated. And um, I remember, like when when my mom was telling me that like dad was sick, it started out as just like oh he he probably has like a cold or something, and um, we started to realize it was a little more serious than that. Um, when he got admitted to the hospital and then and then you know I thought okay you know he doesn't really take care of himself that that much or doesn't really get the checkups that he should be getting so I thought all right the hospital will take care of him he's all good now uh, but then my mom called me and she's like you have to get to the hospital right now you have to see him right now and I got really freaked out and like I texted my sister and I, I was really confused. I didn't know what was happening. So I was, I was working in a complex in Manhattan at the time. And I, I remember I went straight home after work uh, to the hospital. I, I rushed and um, by the time I got there, my mom saw me and she it looked like she had been crying. And, um, and he, he was sedated. They, they had to put him under for, for his, you know, to make sure that, um, they could monitor him correctly and uh and um you know and it really sucked because he 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 was basically asleep for like two months and i i had just missed like seeing him and that that was really the toughest part <clears throat> like felt like you know I didn't know like if he'd wake up or not and I, I didn't know like I, I couldn't I didn't say the things that I probably should have said and that that's the thing that really hurt the most when he was you know when he was under because it was just like two months of like we'll see what happened every day it was like we don't know what'll happen and I, I didn't get to say goodbye I didn't get to do any of the things that I wanted to do. 
so this this put a lot of stress on my family and I I became really withdrawn and distant and you know I couldn't really communicate I, my friends and family came by like Diane and Ferd came by and um, were super supportive like I talking to me and really you know trying to lift my spirits and I I was it was really hard for me to be positive. Um, it put a lot of stress on my family and you know and the doctors basically said like he wouldn't make it and like you know like should we should we pull the plug you know and I remember my mom saying no you know we're not we're gonna keep going and she became a, you know she was like the advocate she was she did not want to leave the hospital like she refused like if she left the hospital she would just go home take a shower then come right back and she just stay in the uh you know in in the ICU like all night and um she stayed by his side and prayed every single day and was so generous and helpful to the nurses and they eventually realized like you know she's not leaving she's not going anywhere you know like we have to like do our best you know because she's not gonna leave and um it was the first time that i really saw someone save literally save someone else's life in person and of course it was my mom right <laughs> of all people of course it was her who else would it be and uh, she stayed by his side and like I said she prayed and she kept our family together through a whirlwind of emotions you know I maybe wasn't the best son or brother and but she was the one who kept it all together and then five months later uh, my dad was released from the hospital and it was probably the first and I I am not like like trying to be dramatic here but like it was the first time that I that I fit, witnessed a miracle firsthand literally when we you know when my dad was recovered later on and then we we went to visit um the the you know the, all the nurses um they were like shocked that he was walking around talking like they really didn't think that he would make it so it was you know it was an amazing thing um just that that hospital was so amazing and i can't thank them enough for all the work that they did it was a really humbling experience so he was rebuilt <laughs> right um my dad had a second chance at life and i started to think about my own mortality uh, you know, how many birthdays did I miss because I was too busy working, too busy making a music video, too busy uh, being available for a rapper and not my close friends and my family who I grew up with, who, who was there for me, you know, before any of this stuff, before any entertainment stuff happened. How many weddings and baby showers were just not important enough to take a day off because I was on call? And how many memories of my daughter was I willing to sacrifice? You know, I, I just, it really set certain things in motion. It really, like I said, made me reevaluate a lot of things. So what was important to me? I almost lost my dad. He almost lost us. And so I knew I had to make some serious changes in my life because I was really not happy where, where I was career-wise. So Big Apple to Tree Town. <laughs> so, all right. So um, the first step was, it was obviously a brief, um, like I said, I was complex. It was a very fulfilling uh, role that I had. I was... Um, like a, a video producer and, and I was working in the editorial then uh, got promoted to um, t 
to the marketing and sales team as a creative video director. And, uh, and I was working on a lot of branded content and a lot of good pieces, a lot of stuff that I'm really proud of and some really amazing people. And I, I also worked at various other media publishers um, in New York City. And this was sort of like when uh, branded content was really getting popular. So that's kind of what I was doing. Uh, but then I realized it was kind of the same pains of music videos, but from inside of like a cubicle corporate space. And uh, but, you know, I'm from New York, obviously, so we're used to suffering. <laughs> uh, we're used to spending half our days on trains and being bombarded with noise. But the thing is, I felt myself going around in, in loops, right? I felt like I was just like walking around this circle and I wasn't I wasn't really being challenged. Like I, I felt like I hit a ceiling of my creativity and and learning in general. So I knew I had to make some changes because things were just getting a little too real. And what it came down to was I wanted a better quality of life for my family and for Nancy and for Chloe. And so Nancy really took it to heart and she knew that, you know, I was really feeling this way for a long time. And so she introduced me to her friend, Sam Valenti, who uh, is the, uh, the owner and the founder of Ghostly, which is this amazing um, record label uh, originally from Detroit and has a lot of roots in Detroit. And he was kind enough to introduce me to Doug Song, who is the CEO of one of the uh, biggest tech companies in Ann Arbor and in Michigan, for that matter. And uh, and yeah, and I think, uh, you know, just like reading a little bit about him, it just felt like we would get along really well. And it was literally perfect timing. And so when I, I flew out, to, to Ann Arbor and I met Doug and I met, you know, a lot of the team, the creative team. Uh, with Doug particularly, we spent like an hour just kind of talking about so many things um, that really had nothing to do with what I would be doing um, if I worked at his company. It was just like about music. It was about skateboarding. It was about graffiti it was about like music videos it was just all of these things all of these culture things that we clicked right away and uh you know and that was back in like 2015 and since then i just really consider doug song to be like a good friend and someone that i really look up to like a big brother like seriously like i mean you you know once you meet doug you kind of get it right away like he's legit like he's for real and so you know just like whether it's in you know, professionally but just also personally someone to someone that i look up to and, and aspire to to kind of like hone some of his good qualities um into my own career so moving on um i met the team you know, and, and all these folks here are people that I work with. And I gotta say the skill set of of all these folks, um, they're as good or even better than some of the creative agencies that I worked with in New York or even LA. And the number one thing that stands out in the work that we do is understanding the technology and the culture. And for this particular, uh, you know, culture is security and hacker culture, right? Uh, but not just understanding it, but really feeling it and connecting with it in a deep and meaningful way. And so we're really good at um, figuring out the emotional connection of like our product and how to hone that into an entertaining story, right? Um, I also began to realize that rappers and hackers have a lot in common. Uh, they both want to overcome limitations and they both have a strong, strong distaste for authority. And sometimes uh, hackers and rappers dabble in illicit activities and that's that's okay. 
But, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say uh, is that I didn't have to sacrifice my artistic integrity or my quality of life because I'm constantly being challenged with new ideas. But now I have the time and the support to, to do it right. And I'm not rushing through a project, right? Um, and it's the emotional response of our videos that motivates me every day. Um, and I think, you know, when I first told people like, oh, I'm moving to Ann Arbor, Michigan, or, you know, all my New York friends are like, what, where, what? Like, what? <laughs> like, no, like, what do you, why? And, um, and at the time I really didn't, I, I really didn't know why. I mean, I visited Ann Arbor for, um, family events and, uh, Nancy's family is from Michigan. So I definitely, you know, was out there a few times. It's just, you know, it was a cool college town, but that's all I knew. Um, I really didn't know what I would be doing out here. I really, I really had no idea. You know, I, I had to leave a lot of those you know, the, the comfort zone of being in New York and having all my resources near me to discover something about myself that I didn't know existed. Um, and it was scary. Um, but you know, like it's been awesome. And if you follow like my Instagram or like my Facebook and stuff, like I, there's a lot of cool stuff that I do out here that I probably wouldn't have had the space or the time to do. Um, in New York. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. And um, the tech nerd paradise. So that's, that's my, <laughs> that's me, right? Now looking my tech nerdiest. Um, so there's a couple of things that I've done that I'm really proud of while I've been out here. So uh, I have a basement now. And like, you know, I live, we live in a duplex and, um, we were, we were paying like this huge rent when we were living in South Orange. And, um, so obviously the, the rent, you know, and property is, is cheaper here in the Midwest. Uh, but you know, that's obvious, right. But, um, the biggest thing was that I have a basement, right. So I've always been into DIY and making things, but I never really had the room to actually make stuff or, you know have like a lot of tools to actually build things. So now that I have a basement, I sort of got in touch with a lot of my maker abilities that I had when I was a kid. And, and I started building my own uh, DIY electric long boards, right? And so that sounds kind of weird, but yeah, I was building my own electric long boards. And, um, and then shortly after that, I started the Carvon Racing League. And that's sort of the first ever electric skateboarding racing league um, in the U S. So that was kind of a fun thing that we recorded. Um, and then in my spare time, I've also created, uh, the A2 tech film showcase. And that's where this picture is from. And it highlights and empowers diversity in filmmaking. And so I, you know, as, like I said, when I was coming up making these music videos, we, it was all my crew was, you know, was comprised of mostly like young dudes. Uh, and young guys usually have the, the most resources and the most disposable time and income to invest in like cameras and lighting and all this gear. And so I, I really kind of, you know, as a, as a dad and sort of like the climate of this industry right now, it just felt like there's, there's not enough diversity in film. There's not enough women in film. Let's make an event. Let's, let's make something that's not like this com competitive festival where like you're just competing against the best film. Let's empower filmmakers. Let's empower people of color. Let's empower women to share their stories. And so this is what that was. And this was held uh, in early January out here. And we had an attendance of like, like over 700 people showed up. We had sponsors um, and we, we screened, you know, these short films from all these diverse filmmakers and our, our one, our two, there were two like submission guidelines. One was like, it had to showcase the consequences of technology. So it was like inspired by black mirror side effects of technology. And the second um, guideline was that the films had to be created by or feature women or people of color. And so right, right there is sort of like opened up the, uh, 
the gates for like these interesting stories that maybe don't get um, enough highlights. Uh, I think, you know, in New York, obviously we have Urban World and we have New York Latino Film Festival and all these like kind of diverse uh, showcases and events. But in the Midwest, you know, it's, it's a little homogenous. So we had to kind of like create something that really uh, opened it up a little more. So obviously there was a big need for it. We had a great turnout. We had some great sponsors. And like I said, we screened it at the uh, historic Michigan Theater, which is this... Um, I think uh, it's like over 1,500 1, seat theater uh, downtown. And they were just really gracious hosts and really supported uh, this movement. So that was that was super sweet, really awesome. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that is by my house and um, that is not regulation height uh, basketball hoop in case you were wondering. <laughs> So make a fire burn again. So what does that mean? So um, I'm still I'm still that scrappy, hungry kid from from Queens, raised in Long Island. I'm still that I'm still that guy. So I probably will, won't stop making music videos because you know that street credibility is real. It's real. It's very real. You know, and I I I will always want to be authentic. You know, it has to be real. Uh, but now that I've discovered another industry, like the tech industry, um, and the need for my skill set in that industry, that is not just like media publishing, it's like, it's tech, right? And the tech that we do is actually, you know, it's, it, it moves the needle in a very big way and solves some really big problems in the world. It's not just like entertaining for entertainment's sake, like it's actually pushing certain things forward, right? And um, and now I have a better perspective, right? Uh, it's not like just about like hashtag set life or about like, I got this camera because of blah, blah, blah. You know, like it's not just like gear worship. It's not camera worship. It's not like trying to like, you know, show off or like be like, you know, have the latest this or latest that or, you know, I, you know, like all, all the stuff that you get caught up with when you're, in the filmmaking industry, all that toxic stuff that I, that I never really was into when I got into it. And I'm still not, thank God. I mean, if I was, then I'd, you know, the trajectory would have been different, but I don't regret that. Like these decisions pointed me in a way that was opening myself up to new things and new learning. And that's, that's what I, that's what it was really all about. Right. And, um, now I have a better perspective. I have a better grasp on my creative emotions and I have way less stress. Like I'm literally biking to the office like five minutes away. You know, I built an electric bike and I, I bike or I walk and like everything is like so close. And like Chloe's school is like right in our backyard basically. And so like all that time, I used to spend so much time commuting I guess I used to spend like an hour commuting from like South Orange into Manhattan. And, you know, there's like at that stop, particularly, there's like over 4,000 people who ride that train daily. So you're literally stuck in a train with like what feels like, you know, 4,000 people, right? And, uh, and sometimes you don't get a seat. And so like all that commuting time, base, and not to mention, um, you know, monthly fee, right? Which is like 400 maybe it's higher now, but that's basically like another rent, right? Just to travel in and out of the city. Um, so uh, that's sort of like gone. Now I have like all this, all this time uh, to spend quality time for Chloe um, and, and just like kind of learning new things. Like I said, all the things I mentioned before that I probably never would have gotten into. And that's super dope. It all comes down to video as well. Like all that stuff like revolves around video and like kind of learning new things about how to create content and and new yeah new technology is always awesome for me um so what am i trying to say so i'm trying to say that i'd encourage anyone who feels like they're stuck in a rut or feeling not feeling challenged to explore opportunities in other industries and adapt your skill set to that role you know like who would have thought that you know, video, music video directing could lead to, you know, 
doing making tech videos right like <laughs> how does that fit right but i think it has less to do with just making video content but also bringing your ideas and your perspective to something whether it's like in the culture or just like just like you know people in other departments like engineer i have like more engineer and and coding friends that i that i ever had in new york right like and that's amazing and, and they're their perspectives I share you know they share things with me I share with them and it's really awesome that I get to see that and learn that and um and I think in general the tech community out here uh reflects a lot of the values that I truly believe in uh people embrace creativity and collaboration to make something just a little bit more real right um there's something very straightforward about the way people create here and it's not like like I said, it's not just to like, you know, not just to show off and not just to be like, you know, bragging about something, right? It's it's really just about, I made this thing and I spent a lot of time on it and hope you dig it and it's usually dope. You know, if you spend a certain amount of time on something, it's gonna be dope. And that's what I felt like I was really starting to discover. I have just a little more time to really shape something into something that I really cared about. Um, and I've also realized that, you know, a healthy quality of life actually does exist. A healthy quality of life does exist. It, I mean, it could be, you know, for me, I found it here, but it was just about getting out of my comfort zone, getting out of a place that, you know, I just kind of like took for granted, unfortunately, like, you know, uh, I was lucky enough to have all my resources when I started when I started doing videos. I was that kid who was like, oh, I have the disposable time and resources to make something. I'm not that person anymore. I don't have that much time to just run around the streets, but you know, I had I still have that that energy and that feeling, you know, and, and it wasn't just to do to be busy just to stay busy. It was because I really truly wanted to innovate. And, and and contribute, contribute something to the culture. And so like, that's that's the biggest thing. And, and, you know, whatever it is, whatever culture I'm into or hobby or whatever, right? Whatever community, uh, I want to be honest about it. I wanna contribute something to it. And most of all, I wanna learn. I need to learn something new. I don't wanna, just keep doing the same things over and over again and pretending like I'm some expert at this one thing. Like I, I can't stand that. I wanna do something new all the time because technology changes every single second. And I wanna be experiencing that in some very real ways and real tangible ways and not just like assert my creative opinion on something and, and never feel it or experience it or have that emotional connection to it. And some people do that. They get a kick out of like, oh yeah, they have like, they could rant on about something that they never experienced, truly. And so like, I don't want to be that guy ever, 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 ever. I don't care where I live. I never want to be that guy. If I am that guy, call me out and and say, hey man, you got to chill out. But otherwise, I never want to be that dude. So, um, and also uh, before I go, uh, I want to share uh, just a little peek into what my life in the tech industry looks like these days. Um, and I think you'll get a kick out of it. Rick, you're a video director. What do you think we should do? Yeah, Rick, how can we create a video that comes off as genuine and not desperate? Thoughtful, but not too serious. Clever, but not overproduced.
And that's all I got. That was pretty much my keynote at Intermittent. It was probably a little longer because we were being timed. So and I think I got, you know, a little emotional there, but um, I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope uh, I hope it inspires you. If you, if again, if you feel like, you know, damn, I wish I did this thing, and but I can't because, you know, I'm stuck. Like, you never know. And, and most of all, if your quality of life improves, then everything else improves. Your family life, your career, and your just overall stress dissipates. And you'll discover something about yourself that you never knew existed. So with that said, if you have any questions or comments, uh, hit me up um, on the blog, runplayback.com or email me, rick at runplayback.com, or hit me up on Facebook. So that's it. I'm out. Peace.